So, um, hello everyone. My name is, oh fuck, now I did it again. Just hang on. Okay, let's try again. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Emil Bay, and today I'm here to talk about how to keep passwords safe in 2017. So just a bit about me. Um, when I'm not hacking on passwords, I, um, I have this little startup thing with a couple of other people called Commodity Trader. And what we do is that we sell grains online. So if you want to buy a boat full of grain, and I mean like a boat full, like 500 tons of grain, you can talk to me after the, uh, the talk and uh, I'll ship you a whole boat full of grain. Online, uh, I'm known as Emil Bayes. Uh, Bayes is like Bayes theorem for math and all that. Okay, yeah. So, uh, and when I'm not working on uh, Commodity Trader, I also do freelancing to um, pay the bills. So that's this guy. I'm from Denmark, so that's why it's a, a Lego guy. Uh, just a bit about my background. I used to study math, but um, didn't stay at it very long because I like to write software as well. Um, besides that, um, before doing Commodity Trader, I have worked at an advertisement agency and I've worked at a high-performance computing lab and most uh, recently, I've worked at a newspaper as a data journalist. But um, today we're here to talk about passwords. So just to keep, get everyone on the same page, I'm sure you know what passwords are, but technically, uh, if you know a password, um, a, pa or a password is something used to identify yourself, right? So if you know a password, then that password is pretty much equivalent to your identity online because uh, when you go on a website, it's not like you're showing your passport or anything like that. You have a password. And the um, state of the world is that everyone has passwords. Uh, like, I mean, my grandmother has a password as well. So um, if you can steal someone's password, it has a lot of implications. And the um, um, as a matter of fact, most people only have one password. So your password is your identity. If someone steals it, they have your whole identity. They can log in as you everywhere on the internet kind of thing. So um, what, do we, what can we do about this? Well, as I see it, there's three things we can do. We can eradicate all security holes, which is a, a pretty noble task, and um, I think that's what the world strives to do, right? But it's uh, probably not going to work out in the short term. Another thing we can do, and I'm um, increasingly convinced that that's the only solution, is to have unique passwords everywhere. And for tech-savvy people, that's what most, what most people do. Uh, I don't know about you, but I keep a password safe with a unique password for every single website because, as I'm going to show you in a moment, you can't really trust websites. But as a um, service provider, one thing you can do is also to use safer password storage. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, here's a question for you. What do all these companies have in common? <laughs> They're visited by this guy. Now, in the Lego world, every Lego man looks alike, so it's, this is not me, this is some other Lego guy, right? Um, so, in this talk, the way we're gonna go about things is that we are gonna build safe password storage from the ground up, and the first way that we could store passwords, and the easiest way, is to use plain text. And I'm sure plain text to a lot of you guys is gonna, like, it has already has the alarm bells ringing, right? So um, let's look at some code here. This is the, uh, if you go and look at the examples after the talk, this is the model I've, uh, I've used throughout all the examples. So we have a, uh, we have a, a database of some, some kind. In this case, it's just a uh, map that sits over in another file. Then we have a register function, and a login function, because often these two functions are not symmetrical. I mean, the register function, you take and you store the password, while in the login function, you have to verify that the password is the same um, as was provided when you signed up. And uh, we return true or false, if, if the, uh, well, um, depending on whether the password is, is valid. And you can see down here at the bottom, I have a, uh, a register function where I register my username and then I, because we are in Germany, I've chosen my password to be Handschuhe, which means glove, but literally translated means like handshoe, so I don't know. Um, and then we are first gonna attempt to log in and we should see true over in the console, and then afterwards I'm gonna use, um, use the wrong, a wrong password, which is Spaßvogel, which kind of means, literally translated means funny bird, but it could also like mean funny guy kind of thing. So let's try and run this and we can just see that 
our model for this talk works, so we get a true and a false, which we are supposed to. Great. Now, as I said before, um, plain text doesn't really work out, but that doesn't um, stop these guys from actually implementing plain text storage for passwords. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Sony, uh, famous Sony hack that was in 2011 where they like, stole all of the PlayStation network. All the passwords were there, there were stored in plain text. Uh, Bell, a Canadian telecom provider, stored all the um, passwords in plain text. Comcast, yeah, OK. <laughs> um, so the problem, plain text, just a problem enough in itself. What can we do about it? Well, we can try and obscure the passwords. I don't want to say encrypt the passwords, because that's not what we're going to do. Um, we're going to look at a, another offender later who actually did encrypt their passwords, but they had no idea what they were doing. So, um, OK. So what we're going to use is something called a hash function. So a hash function, um, you probably all know what a hash function is, or like you've probably at least heard the word hash function. Hash functions is what powers the small uh, random numbers that you get from your git commits. But hash functions have a lot of other properties that are very favorable in our case. A hash function is one, deterministic. So deterministic means that the output is solely dependent on the input. There's nothing in there like what is the alignment of the planets or what's the, uh, yeah, I don't know, random number or something, take a rabbit up a hat kind of thing. So deterministic, very important. Uh, Prophecy number two, it is pre-image resistant. So that's a nice way of saying that it's one way. I mean, um, it means that you can't take the output and figure out what the input was. You can only take the input and get an output, never the other way around kind of thing. Then it also has another property that sounds kind of similar, the second pre-image resistant. And that means that um, you can't, if you have a hash function, or you have the hash, you know what the uh, input to the hash function was, you can find another input that gives the same hash. So that means if um, that means you can find another password that gives the same hash, uh, meaning that you would be able to find like a completely different password and try and crack the password, uh, the hashing function. And the last thing is uh, collision resistance, and that's kind of an involuntary collision, meaning that by some accident, two passwords map to the same hash, which is uh, kind of nasty as well. So. These are the properties the hash function have to, um, to obey, and we're not going to build a hash function. Uh, there's hash functions out there. Uh, so yeah, I studied math. I spent like three years being able to write the last slide in like this notation here. So um, yeah, waste of time, some people might say. But I mean, this looks <laughs> fancy, right? So um, another nice thing about hash functions. So hash functions have like heaps and heaps of applications. We're just going to use them for password. But that star up there is like one of the most amazing properties about hash functions. That means that you can take like a extremely long stream of bytes or of, of bits, and you can hash it down to something that's finite. So it has like n bits in there, and that's pretty amazing. And something that if you go study hash functions will just boggle your mind. So uh, was that demo? No, the demo comes in. So here's a couple of hash functions. You probably heard some of them. MD5. MD5 was the her first hash function I learned about, and I learned about it when I was building a password system in PHP. Now, the problem is that I was born in 1993. MD5 was starting to break in 1996. So I was still wearing a diaper when MD5 was broken. SHA-1, you probably all heard about the recent Shattered paper, the Shatter attack. Uh, SHA-1 is broken too. It was a nice, it, has, it had a nice run, but uh, yeah, it's gone now. Then we have a couple of other hash functions there, the ones in gray. These are cryptographically secure hash functions, but they are very, very fast, and that's something we don't want which I'll also show in a minute. Then at the end, we actually have, so you might have a hard time seeing this, but I'll just read it up. We have bcrypt, scrypt, and argon2. bcrypt and scrypt are still hash functions that you can use to store passwords. It's not what I recommend, but you can do that. And then we have argon2, and argon2 I have something to sell about later. So uh, I have a little demo. Let's just open it up here. So um, because everyone knows MD5, I, I, and, and to make it clear that this is not the way you should do it, I used MD5 as a hash function up here. Um, if we run this, you can see that it, oh, note. It gives the same output as it before. Um, pretty simple. Uh, now, instead of doing a strict equality um, to the string that we are passed in, we have to hash the password again and, um, 
and, and compare the two hashes. And uh, you can see here, I also tried to use some, some German words. Schildkröte, which is like turtle, and Berliner. Um, yeah, we get the output that we expect. So this is like the boiled down version of how you would um, do a hash in Node with core crypto. Uh, a hash, the output of a hash function is often, often also called a digest because you're like digesting something big into something small. These are the offenders. <laughs> I don't know if you know these guys, but um, in 2015, and I said that this was broken when I was wearing a diaper, in 2015, uh, these guys uh, were hacked, um, passwords leaked, and it turned out that they had used MD5 as the hash function for their passwords. <laughs> so, um, and why, why, is this a bad, why is this a bad idea? It's because there's a very f um, famous attack called a dictionary attack that you can perform on a, um, on, a, on a passwords that are hashed this way. What you do is that you have a dictionary, a large table of words or common passwords or some way of generating um, candidate passwords. Then you take all the passwords or the words that your candidate words, you just run them through the hash function, that's very, very fast, and then you afterwards look up in your table whether you could find, um, whether you have a hash that matches the password you're trying to crack, and then you have the plain text. And I don't know, this might seem far-fetched, but it's actually very fast to run. So here I have um, taken the, um, oh wait, is this gonna work? Yeah, it's gonna work. So I've taken the, uh, the built-in dictionary that's on, uh, on pretty much all Nix machines, and um, I've run the code that we saw on the last slide, and we are now gonna try and um, crack my password. And this, this is a shitty MacBook Pro, it runs in like 1.3 gigahertz, it has two physical cores and four virtual cores. So, I mean, it was probably state of the art like eight years ago, hardware-wise, and we cracked my password, which was secret in like 1.3 seconds. So, yeah, rainbow tables are very powerful if people don't know what they're doing, kind of thing. So, yeah. Problem, rainbow tables, what can we do about it? We can, so the issue is that if, if a lot of people in the same database have the same passwords, they're all gonna have the same hash, and uh, research shows that a lot of people choose very common passwords. So we are gonna try and obscure that people have the same passwords or make it, make it, uh, make it very hard to generate these rainbow tables. So um, we want the identical passwords to yield unique hashes. So how do we do that? We use salt, solid hashes. So solid hashes makes pre uh, So the, the way you do a dictionary attack um, is that you generate these huge rainbow tables because storage is cheap, and you can even go and buy pre-made rainbow tables. So um, we want to make it impractical to generate these rainbow tables. And um, the way we do that is that we salt the passwords so in, um, in this case, I can actually use the cursor. In this case, I generate a salt, I generate a cryptographically secure um, number of bytes, and I prepend them to the password, then I have a separator, and then I have the password. And um, then when we store it in the database, we need to, put, we need to save the salt. And an important uh, point to make is that the salt doesn't have to be private. The salt is just some random value. It's not sensitive in any way. You don't need to encrypt it or anything like that. You can just store it in the database, because the point is that if an um, adversary breaks your database and dumps all the passwords, then you would have to generate a unique rainbow table for every single of the users because they all have a random piece of data in the password. Um, and we can run this if we want to. It's um, not too interesting. Oh, wait. Oh, that's because I just... So yeah, this goes like that. Uh, very fast and efficient, and it's, um, it's very easy to implement. So here's the, uh, here's the details. I just chose uh, 64 random bytes because um, all hash functions have something called block size. MD5 has a block size of, I think, um, 512 bits. 64 times eight, that's 512, right? Maybe, I don't know, uh, something like that. So, but, um, yeah, so these are the offenders. It's still very easy to break these, um, these sorted um, solid hashes, it was state of the art like uh, eight years ago, and I guess that's why it is still like common knowledge that it's okay to just salt passwords and store them in the database, but 
what these guys also did was that they used a very, very fast and efficient hash functions. So I think some of them used MD5, which was still broken, so still don't do that. Uh, and some of them uh, used SHA-1, which is also broken now, so don't do that either. Um, but I mean, they're kind of forgiven in a way. They still had eight years to, uh, to migrate though, so I mean, I don't know if that's forgiven. Problem. It's way too efficient. It takes way too little time to crack these passwords. So you can um, you can just go to Amazon and and ha um, rent out one of their big GPU servers and um, crack up the uh, password hashing. I saw a benchmark for um, sal salted SHA-1 with the tool called Hashcat, and it could do something like uh, 2,000 million hashes a second on the big Amazon server. The big Amazon server only costs oh. That's the sound again. Uh, the big Amazon server only costs something like $8 an hour, I think. So when you think about cracking passwords, you have to think about not how much time does it take, you have to think about how many dollars does it cost. The other day, I read about a mathematician uh, at some US university who was working with these special curves. And to study the curves, you had to generate like heaps and heaps of them. And um, to generate all the curves he was trying to study it took uh, 60 CPU years. So 60 CPU years, sounds like a long time. But uh, he just went on Google, rented a bunch of servers, and it only took him an afternoon to run 60 years of computation. So that's where um, the, very, like, the intuition we have about time doesn't really map to cracking passwords. So what can we do about this? Burn some money. So we can try and make it less efficient to crack our passwords. How do we do that? We use uh, iterated hashing. And iterated hashing is one of the techniques you can actually use today if what you're doing needs to be NIST compliant. You can use uh, a built-in function in Node Crypto called PBKDF2, so password-based key derivation function 2. And uh, that's what we're going to do now. So um, the thing with the, um, with the um, iterated hash functions is that not only do you give a salt and a password, you also give a work factor. So how many times does it need to take the output from one hash iteration, use it as input to the next hash iteration, and so on and so forth. And here we are going to use at, um, I want to use number five instead. Oh. So you can see now it takes a bit of time. There was the true, there was the false. So um, now we're doing something like, I don't know, 200 milliseconds maybe for every time you need to authenticate a user. That's very good because now an attacker, instead of using maybe one millisecond per password or per hash, has to spend 200 milliseconds per hash. And suddenly those maybe 60 CPU years turn into 1,000 CPU years or similar. Um, this is what you need to do to use the um, PBKDF2. You can see there's a lot of parameters you have to save in your database here, and a lot can go wrong, and you have to think about uh, what about the future when this uh, hash function is broken, then we need to upgrade and all that stuff. But um, you need to give a salt. You need to choose an iteration count, so how many times we're going to run through this. You need to choose how long a hash do you want, and you need to choose what hash algorithm do you want to use. And then you pass all that in, runs asynchronously in another uh, worker thread so it doesn't block uh, the event loop, and back you get an error or the hash. So you can do this today. I don't recommend you do this, but you can. Dropbox did this, uh, and I don't want to call them out on it. Well, it's not bad, it's not bad. Uh, they used an um, iterated hash cipher uh, called uh, bcrypt. You have maybe heard of bcrypt. bcrypt is based on a uh, block cipher called blowfish, and um, the only issue with uh, bcrypt, which is, which is kind of a non-issue, is that it limits the password to 72 characters. I mean, um, if you use, I, I, don't, I don't know anyone who would be able to remember like a 72 character password. It's more of a problem if you use a passphrase instead of a password. Um, so the problem here is still that it's very, very easy to just run all these hash functions in parallel. And that's the whole deal with the GPU is that instead of having one call with a lot of memory, you have like thousands of cores, each with very little memory. And I'm saying memory, memory all the time because I'm kind of hinting at what can we do next? Burn even more money. So just burn all the money on hashing. And now we are getting to what is kind of the state of the art today, and that is um, key derivation functions, but a special kind of key derivation function which is purposefully, purposefully slow. 
because it both uses a lot of memory and a lot of computation. And here we have it, Argon2. So um, in 2013, the academic community kind of had enough. There had been way too many breaches. It was way too easy to crack these passwords. And there was no clear consensus. Or, well, there kind of was, but there was no one place you could point to and say, just use this and forget about all the other details. So um, they made a competition. They had a lot of entries in there. And Argon2 was their recommendation at the end, at the end of the com uh, competition. So let's fire up Argon2. So let's see, that's the number seven. And you can see it's computing. Take a long time. Maybe it's taking a too long time. So that's what I was saying about this uh, MacBook. Oh, yeah, there we go. So that was the first verification. And now it's trying to verify the next one. And you can see that uh, it comes out there. Now, uh, one issue is that, and I'll show that by showing you the code. So the, the issue is that. This is blogging. I was trying to, um, when the hash function was spun up to uh, authenticate, I was trying to log out. Um, I was trying to log out console uh, that log with the hash to just show you that the event loop wasn't blocked, but it was. So that's kind of an issue. Which you if you have a server running with like thousands of people trying to authenticate, then um, you only have one guy at a time authenticating, and that's going to get your users very mad at you. So, um, but the good thing about this is that I want to show you just the uh, performance profile of the two functions. So here I have the um, the PBKDF2 in a, a file where I cram uh, rammed up the iteration count to something very high. So we actually have a chance to start top. So top is a uh, Unix command to show um, how much memory and how much CPU a uh, given process is using. So I'm just going to spin up here. You can see that the uh, node process is packing my CPU at 100%, but it's, the node process is only using something like 9 kilobytes or 9,000, uh, so 9 megabytes of memory, which isn't very much. I mean, the uh, top of the line uh, GPU, cluster, uh, GPU server at Amazon has something like 24 gigabytes of video memory. So I don't know how much 24 gigabytes divided by 9 megabytes is, but it's a lot, like heaps and heaps. So let's just kill this. And um, instead, let's go and look what the performance profile of Argon 2 is. So again, I spun up the, uh, the work factor like heaps. And uh, let's try and run it. And you can see now that it's again pegging my CPU, but it's also taking up 500 megabytes of memory. So. It's very easy to do the math. 24 gigabytes divided by 500 megabytes, that's like 48. So you can do 48 of these um, cracking, uh, cracking attempts in parallel, which isn't very much. So nice. But the problem is that it was blocking. Um, this is the, uh, if you want to do the blocking stuff, this is how you do it. You, um, I have a small library with one of my friends called Matthias, Mavintosh Online. It's called Sodium Native. It exposes uh, Argon2 as, uh, as the PB hash function. Um, so you can go use it if you want to. But as you can see, it's a bit complicated. Um, so yeah, it was blocking. What can we do? We can make it asynchronous. And that's what I've done for you. I've made it asynchronous. All you have to do is run npm install secure password, and I'll make your password secure for you. <laughs> that's why I have the crypto beard. So um, you can use this today. Um, it came out like two weeks ago, and I'm still um, adding in a bunch of other features. One feature I'm still missing is that because it is using so much memory, it's actually a very real scenario that your box might run out of memory and the process will crash, like the operating system will kill it for you. So um, I'm using, I'm, I'm, I'm still. Um, Working on putting in like a queue mechanism, and you can inspect the queue and choose whether to like balance off the um, the hashing to another machine and something like that. It's very easy to use. You can see here's all that's to it. You don't need to think about salting or think about the work parameters or um, think about the algorithms or anything like that. Think about forward compatibility. Forward compatibility is very important when we do hash functions because 
if there is a paper coming out tomorrow saying that there's a reduction attack on Argon2, we want to switch to something else maybe. So we can do that with this library too. Um, doesn't get much easier than this. Um, I can just show you. So the parameters we ran Argon2 with before in blocking mode uh, were pretty high as well. So with the secure password, the default settings should be good for now. Um, they are set to um, what the backing library calls interactive settings, so settings that are suitable for uh, passwords on the web. And if we run it, you can see it's pretty fast. So it's not like a, your users have to sit there and wait for several seconds for you to uh, compute the hash and authenticate them. Now we are running out of time. So um, I mean, you can take this home with you. Um, it has a couple of options up there. You can see that in the readme, what, what you can configure. Um, it's very easy to use, and uh, it has an equally easy uh, verify function for you to use. There's also a sync, sync version in there if you want to use that uh, for command line stuff or whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, wait, there we go. Thank you.